Hello and welcome. My name is Thilo Schumann. I'm from Canon Automation, uh, and I'm presenting today uh, our webinar on embedded networking for this year. Uh, I'm with Canon Automation for more than 20 years right now. Uh, I'm, as of this, I'm, I'm a CAN expert for more than 20 years uh, right now. I will, uh, I'm an expert in multiple standardization groups on international level or national level. And of course, uh, pr uh, doing standardization work within uh, the CIA. My, uh, I am specifically focused over the last years in um, more generic uh, base things like uh, in safety and security. Safety is already also right now a topic for more than 20 years uh, for me. Canon Automation, as you may know or not know, is a nonprofit organization. It's uh, the international users and manufacturers uh, um, organization established in 1992 with more than 700 members worldwide. So we are having um, 30 years anniversary this year, and we will celebrate it uh, with our members. We maintain and develop many uh, different CAN related specifications and CAN open related specifications. We are also performing the uh, CAN open conformance tests. Of course, as I said, as I'm present uh, in, in different international and national standardization groups, that is part of my work for Canon Automation, because as Canon Automation, we want to support uh, any can related standard and standardization effort internationally and nationally. We also provide uh, technical support by some means of a hotline, uh, so it can be called in and uh, or email can be sent to, to service. We are also providing different types of uh, seminars in-house. Maybe in near, near time future, uh, we will provide also in-person seminars. Our general topic of CAN automation, of course, is to foster the image of CAN in all uh, markets and applications. Since the beginning, since the founding basically of Canon Automation, we published the CAN newsletter. We have an, uh, the magazine, uh, which is available for download as PDF as well. We have an online version with latest product news and updates. And for any non-member who wants uh, to stay up to date, you can uh, subscribe to our monthly in info mail and yeah, just send an email to mail at cancr.org and one and subscribe and say that you want to have to receive it, then we will uh, put you on the list. So what, what's about CAN or what's about embedded networks and CAN and where it came from? So CAN originally started, as you may, some of you know, in the uh, mid eighties, and started uh, then early on for the, uh, as a specific development for automotive use. It was in the early 90s that CAN was used in automotive, but also in the non-automotive area, CAN started to, to become ubiquitous in uh, embedded networks, in connecting actuators, sensors, and different devices and the like together that data can be exchanged. It started off with very simple networks where we have uh, a controlling device, a controller, and then we have connected the several uh, inputs and output devices and each and other could exchange data. We had also several, especially in the automotive area and partly also in, in other areas, uh, subcontrollers connected, which were able to exchange messages. And so we had a very simple network with a trunk line and all the devices connected on the same, very same trunk. And sometimes even as can 
uh, should be a line technology. They are being connected as stars to make it easier to connect and disconnect uh, depending on certain requirements, uh, different devices. Over the years, those simple networks evolved because there was more need to, to connect more devices and uh, for the different areas in my embedded use case, like in a, in a, uh, in a mobile machine, we have the use case of the, the engine. We have the use case of, uh, yeah, in this case, like uh, controlling the crane and, and, and other stuff. And so it evolved that we have more and more devices connected for certain purposes. And each of those purposes have their own specific networks. And they then were uh, maybe interconnected via some gateways. So we have in these areas, multiple different CAN networks. We have multiple different um, higher layer protocols using uh, on top of those CAN networks. That's maybe for diesel engine control at J1939 for the mobile machine control uh, can open base or some proprietary uh, can based networks. In the last years, um, it started um, to, to structure the thing. So we had originally like a patch, uh, patchwork network, uh, all things patched somehow together, but over the last years, it, it became a more standard to, to, uh, to organize it more in a, in a more better way to make it more easier to maintain our network generations, but also for the service people. So we started with what, what we call a domain oriented architecture or a domain oriented system where I have certain application domains and all the specific devices are connected within those the net, uh, domains. And then we are running some kind of a backbone between those domains. So in the typical uh, uh, yeah, mobile machine that would be the drive train, the boom control, the sensor, the telematics and all those different kinds of, of things. But now also in, uh, inspired from the automotive industry, we, uh, those kind of networks are being reorganized in what uh, it's called in a zone architecture, in a zonal architecture. Because uh, the thing is uh, with the domain, or if I shortly go back, with the domain oriented systems, I have the problem that all the sensors and actuators dedicated to a certain domain are connected on the, on the same physical network. But the problem is those different sensors are maybe placed in the machine on all different ends. So that means I still have a lot of wiring in a domain oriented architecture. And to go to reduce those domain oriented systems, and the new sonar architecture is being introduced and is being developed and, and will be uh, the central thing. So that means um, those different zones are more physical zones which are interconnected, but each of those zones um, cover all the different applications. And the, like, and the domain part then is basically just a virtual layer on top of this. So the physical and the virtual functionality, the physical network and the virtual functionality is being subdivided, which in the domain oriented architecture is still uh, connected to each other. So with those developments in the sonal architecture, we have future requirements, especially in the backbone. We, we have the requirement of network scalability especially scalability regarding bit rates, data lengths, so bandwidth issues like this. We still have the problem to integrate legacy approaches. We want to combine different communication standards, so that must be uh, in some way an open communication, and the different uh, components and protocols are multi-sourced. So that means that we need some 
standardization. And to allow interoperability, of course, we need to have those standardized components conformance tested as the first level on providing interoperability. And on the next interoperability level too, um, we need to provide interoperability tests like plug phase and these. And then of course, at the end of the day, everything should be available at a reasonable price. So, and, and all those future requirements are come together and one, one, uh, one future requirement which I, which I didn't really mention was all those systems are connected some way to, these, uh, to the internet. So we are having the requirement on tunneling and forwarding IP packets or Ethernet packets or, or all these kind of things. So, and yeah, it's, it's becoming more and more and we are having more requirements on, on those different levels. And for that reasons, we have now three gen, uh, can generations or three and a half type of generation. We have our classical CAN with uh, yeah, J1939 or CAN open as a higher layer protocol, or even in, in automotive industry with Autosar on top. So in those classical CAN networks, we are typically running the networks at 250K or in some areas at 1500K and we have, are able to transmit payloads of eight bytes. And about 10 years ago, CanFD has been developed with the domain ar uh, architecture requirements in mind. CanFD is now available. CanFD is in use in automotive. And the first uh, mobile machines are starting to develop in CanFD in their systems. CanFD usually runs at 500K uh, arbitration rate and with a higher data rate of maybe one megabit per second or two megabit per second. But it allows now to have a payload of uh, 64 byte. So that's a huge improvement, which we have. But the, of course, it, it also comes with its, uh, uh, with its shortcomings. So that means I have to really design my, my network, I have to, design in, I have to have uh, knowledge of my physical connections of my EMVI uh, requirements and these kind of things. And it is intended for, yeah, in the domain architecture for, yeah, as a, as a backbone to communicate between ECUs. It is not really suited for the communication of sensor values of simple actuator things of, of simple signal. And with that in mind, we now have developed CanFD Light. CanFD Light is more the light version of CanFD. It's, it's running at a fixed data rate of one megabit per second. And it is, yeah, a more simpler uh, version of CanFD and that allows it to be implemented in very simple microcontrollers, which don't have a need for oscillators and, and stuff like that. And in parallel, we are going with the zone architecture. That will be the future. That is the thing what we are having in our next cars, in, in our next machines and all these kind of things. And so the bandwidth requirements are, are going up and we have to interconnect with IP-based networks. And so we developed CanXL. CanXL is designed to have now a data rate of up to 10 megabit per second and payloads up to two kilobyte. So, and, and so we are, we are going those three generations of Can. So again, the classical limits of CAN uh, or uh, the, the limits of classical CAN, of course, we have our limit at one megabit per second. 
Normally those networks are run with 250K or, or 500K. We have the bitrate dependency on the network length. So it is, so the one megabit I can use only for small networks for 10 meter of cable or 30 meter of cable. But if I have longer networks like in a lift application with 200 meters of cable, I have to go down with the bit rate. And that's difficult. That, that is good for just the control data, but we have more and more requirements, especially in diagnostic services, which run in parallel. And we are limited with the eight byte payload. And you know, the, the, clan, the classical CAN data frame, we have our, uh, our CAN frame structure with, uh, with the arbitration field of 11 bit or 29 bit identifier and uh, the payload of eight byte and the CRC field. So about 10 years ago, as I said, CAN FD were developed with the requirements for a domain-based architecture. It, was, it is a quite improvement with data rates of up to five megabit per second, currently usable with one megabit or two megabit per second. And if you drive a, a quite modern car, you have it already in your car. We still have some kind of a bitrate dependency on the network links, but that's only true for the arbitration bitrate, which we still are going with 250 or 500K. But of course, with the data rate, we are still a bit longer. And we can use now a payload of 64 byte, which is also a huge improvement, especially in, in applications where I need to synchronize drives together, or in general, I need to have the requirement to synchronize actuators together. And I can do that right more easily because I can put all the, all the commands, all the command requirements, all the output data in a single CAN frame. And so the, the transmission of the CAN frame means already synchronization of the actuator. The CAN FD frame structure hasn't much changed over the classical CAN. We still have our uh, arbitration field of 11 bit or 29 bit identifier. <clears throat> and now we have our data field with up, up to 64 bytes. Of course, we changed, we had the requirement to change the CRC <clears throat> to be more better because we need to cover more data bytes. And because with CanFD, we want to be as reliable and as robust as with classical CAN. We don't want to lose any of those additional features. I said, <coughs> CanFD has a problem, its shortcomings, because it requires some uh, some powerful mic microcontrollers. It is not available or yeah, in small microcontrollers, which short amount uh, of RAM with, uh, uh, um, with no oscillators and all these kind of things. So on very simple microcontrollers. But I want to have a clean network structure. And so I want to integrate very simple sensors, very simple actuators also in, in those kind of networks. And so CanFD Lite is being developed. It is a very simple version of CanFD. So that means um, why in, in CanFD, we have a, 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 yeah, a multi, uh, multi-controller bus access so everybody is able to talk. We have no central commander. In CanFD, we changed it to a commander responder communication. So that means we have our central controller, which is the commander and controls the network flow. And then we have all the devices, which are basically just, which are just responders to those 
to this commander. And in KNFD light, the data rate is fixed to one megabit per second. You can still utilize the uh, 64 byte. The data frame as such, of course, is the same like in KNFD. This is all available. We have the specifications available. Uh, the controllers are available. And even for KNFD Lite, the commander controller, existing KNFD controllers can be used for that. So there is an existing base available on, on the market, which I can use today. One improvement in, in the process on, 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 on going from CAN to CAN FD, um, we had uh, some issues in utilizing higher data bit rates. And that's a problem um, as you go with higher data rates means you go with higher frequencies and you are getting problems like ringing on the cable. And for that, we develop a signal improvement circuitry, the so-called SIG, and the SIG transceivers are also available, which makes it much more easier to use the higher uh, data rates. And as I said, the requirement of course is um, <clears throat> the, the, the problem is I always have some kind of ringing if I don't have an uh, circuitry uh, uh, in, involved, which helps an active circuitry involved, which helps reducing those ringing. So I always have this kind of ringing. And this ringing, of course, with lower data rate, it doesn't matter. But as higher our data rates go, we have a problem with this ringing. And so the SIG circuitry is being uh, developed and is available as SIG in so-called SIG transceivers, and it highly improves our network reliability and even helps in the robustness of the network. And first tests also with uh, the circuitry used in, in, in CanXL in environments, to which I come in, in a few seconds, sh have shown that the SIG transceiver even has a huge improvement in classical CAN-based networks. It has a huge improvement because it helps on, on our standard problems, which we have in the field, which is some guy didn't have the termination switched on. Even in those kind of networks, it really helps and it improves our network uh, quality and improves the robustness of CAN. As I said, um, for to be future proof uh, and to, to uh, be able to, um, to move into the zonal architecture, we have developed CANXL. We are still in the process of developing CANXL. That said, the basic specifications are already uh, stable and published. And we, we, we expect to have the first controllers available beginning next year. The improvement of course here is we allow now to have a data rate of up to 10 megabit per second. And we have the improvement of a data field, which now can hold up of two kilobyte or 2048 byte of data, which basically fits a complete ethernet frame. So that allows us to tunnel ethernet and to tunnel IP packets and to tunnel all those kind of other networks. The CANX data frame looks very similar to a classical CAN frame or uh, to a CAN FD frame. There's only a few exceptions. We now have only 11-bit uh, priority ID. 
you don't have any more the 29 bit uh, identifier. But in the control field, we now have a 32 bit additional address field. So in the past, when the, with the 29 bit identifier, we had the, the side issue that many use the identifier not only for priority reasons, but also for address information. Now with CanXL, we having our 11 bit identifier, which is dedicated priority identifier. And we have an additional 32 bit address information in there. Of course, we now have also improved CRCs because we want to have the same reliability like we have with classical CAN and CANFD. Some of the specifications are already published and available. Semiconductor manufacturers are currently in the process of implementing them and uh, announced just in January that they will be available at the beginning of next year. So the specification for CANXL is our basically our 610 series. We have the 610 uh, part one, which is basically the CANXL specification with um, the conformance test plan currently being developed. We have uh, the physical me medium attachment specification with the test plan currently developed. And just waiting for release, but already pop, uh, uh, finished the work is uh, the specification on the service data unit types that allows us to identify the data transmitted in the CANXL data frame, which basically defines Ethernet tunneling. We are also currently working on a security framework to allow directly on the network end-to-end -end security and also to allow fragmentation of the data. So that means CANXL is backwards compatible to CANFD. We have our 11-bit uh, priority ID. We have the 2048-byte payload with an additional 32-bit address field. We have a virtual CAN ID, which allows us to separate virtually on the same physical network, different uh, CANXL networks. And of course, we have an improved CRC uh, possibilities because we want to have reliability as we had already with the classical CAN and CANFD. I said we have the uh, priority 11 priority ID as we had in classical CAN, CANFD. We now have it available again. So that means it allows the integration of CANXL into existing networks much more easier. And in addition, we now have the 32-bit address uh, field, which uh, uh, with additional even hardware filters, which will be provided by the CAN controllers. And that allows to offload all the, uh, all the data, which is not intended for me and uh, makes it much more easier to use and to utilize the processing power of, of my microcontrollers. We have the virtual CAN ID, an additional uh, uh, thing which is comparable to, to the, uh, the VLAN ID we have in Ethernet. We even defined a direct mapping between uh, those two. And the virtual CAN ID allows us to have, have different virtual CANXL networks on the same, very same physical network on the very same, uh, yeah, physical network that allows us up to, to have up to 256 virtual networks. And those different virtual networks could be 
the same higher layer protocols. It could be different higher layer protocols. So that really helps us in the implementation of the zonal architecture because each of the different application domains could use different virtual kernel IDs. So that, e that provides us uh, a way to implement zonal architecture much more easier. I said, uh, the specification is finished. It needs to be published. So it's just, just some internal uh, a delay we had, um, but it allows us to directly identify the data which is being transmitted within the CANX airframe. And we have the possibility of course, to directly tunnel or, or map uh, legacy higher layer protocols. We, uh, legacy 11 bit can uh, classical can frames can fd frames 29 bit can uh, frames on onto the can xl network so that allows us a, a direct tunneling of the class of the existing solutions so it makes integration much more easier and of course it allows us tunneling of ethernet frames so even here we have a direct integration much more easier <clears throat> we use different cascaded CRCs to make the error detection much more better. So we have a dedicated header CRC this time. So to enable us to directly immediately uh, uh, detect any errors during transmission in the header. And then we have an additional header at the end, which covers the header and the data. And it is been evaluated by two different universities uh, that it is that we have the same reliability even with those long long frames and you know CSC is a problem because CSC is, is a statistical method which allows us detecting errors of certain data stream sizes and they have their shortcomings if the data stream sizes are much shorter or much longer. And so with the definition of uh, CANXL and the, and, 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 and the way we use CSC here, it is proven by different universities that we still have the sa very same reliability here. I said we are working currently to implement security directly on the hardware level so that we have direct hardware support in the CAN controller. The security is being developed to allow us authenticated messages, to allow us encrypted messages and any combination thereof. Um, we have currently defined two uh, uh, different AAS mechanisms uh, and uh, uh, bit sizes, uh, 128 bit size and a 256 bit size to be future proof. And of course, uh, we will stay up to date and include other mechanisms in future if requirements occur. The, can, the security includes an additional can security header, a CANSEC header, which is eight byte in size. So that basically means from the 2048 uh, bytes available in the CANXL frame. So I then after that have, have only available 2040 bytes. So that's uh, a short webinar on where we are with embedded networking in 2020 with CAN, with the current state of, of CAN, classical CAN, CAN FD, what is the future with uh, the availability of CAN FD light, which becomes, which is specified and which is already uh, usable, simpler microcontrollers are being developed and will be available shortly, and CANXL will be available at first implementations at next year and automotive makers, uh, automakers are currently in the process on designing in CanXL into their next platforms, which then will be uh, 
available in a few years from now. So thanks uh, for participating in the webinar. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to contact us or contact me. Um, I just want, want to uh, add to that. You can contact us at, uh, um, for our mailing services to stay up to date, to subscribe to our uh, monthly uh, info mail. Just write an email to mail at, at kencr.org and you state that you want to subscribe. Or if you have any specific technical questions, you can contact us via service at kencr.org. Thank you.